Output Institute for Global Affairs. Welcome back to our webinar series, Building Sustainable Futures, Global Challenges and Possibilities. And in this series, we focus on research at Northwestern in conversation with leading global thought leaders that furthers the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And every quarter, we choose a different UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals and sort of drill down in it. And this fall, we've been exploring SDG number 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. So today, our focus is on what makes for strong international institutions. And in particular, we're going to focus on something that's very much in the news in the United States now, which is uh, with our new administration uh, incoming, which is uh, international cooperation. So we've heard recently from Biden's new uh, national security team that cooperation will be the touchstone of American foreign policy. But what is it? And um, although most of us would probably agree that cooperation is better than, you know, America first, um, is all cooperation always good? Are there any unintended consequences to friendly, pragmatic cooperation? Um, does um, cooperation ever mask inequalities or even violence? And how do we design better, more equitable forms of cooperation? Well, to talk about this, uh, we have something of a wonderful point counterpoint discussion today. Uh, and I'm honored to introduce you to two wonderful, wonderful thought leaders on this subject. Drs. Ian Hurd from Northwestern and Dr. Uh, Jonas Grimhead. So first, Ian. Ian is the director of the Weinberg College Center for International and Area Studies, and he's a professor of political science at Northwestern University. He studies the interaction of international law and politics. And his latest book is a study of the international rule of law called How to Do Things with International Law. And he's currently writing a new book, which will be out next year, I'm told, called The Life and Times of Liberal Internationalism. Now, Jonas Grimheden is a specialist in international human rights law at the European Union's Advisory Body on Human Rights, the European Union's Agency for Fundamental Rights in Vienna. And he's also an associate professor of international human rights law at Lund University in Sweden as well as a regular lecturer at, in Beijing. He's a world-renowned expert in Chinese law in particular, but he doesn't stop there. He has conducted research or, and taught in some 20 countries. And um, he can tell wonderful stories about such things as human rights missions to places like North Korea, if you're interested. So. Um, Ian and Jonas are going to engage in conversation for about 30 minutes and then we'll open it up to all of you. So if you have questions at any point, you can just start putting them in the chat function to the, for this window and we will ask them of Ian and Jonas um, in about half an hour. So welcome Ian and Jonas and thanks for being with us and over to you. Thanks. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Annalise. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks, Ariel, too, and everybody for making this work. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So, um, as Annalise said, my career has been more or less devoted to understanding international organizations and the international legal system. So, that means institutions like the United Nations and the World Trade Organization, and also how regimes and institutions like the idea of the rule of law organize international politics. And these, of course, are all things Trump White House seems to have been dedicated to destroying these past few years. Trump has come to an end. A lot of people are celebrating the return to international cooperation at the heart of American foreign policy. And I'm a little suspicious about this return to cooperation narrative. So I want to explain a little bit about why, and then we can get into some of the details that animate um, the research. I think there's a popular myth among foreign policy thinkers that the post-World War II era was characterized by intergovernmental cooperation to create a system of institutions that would govern for the benefit of everybody. It's a very common way of sort of summarizing how the, uh, the system of the second half of the 20th century was different than other international systems. I call it a myth. Uh, I think it rests on a couple of assumptions, convictions, that don't stand up to much scrutiny 
but that by, by thinking them through, we can start to see a better way of understanding the world. A couple of assumptions, I said. So first, the assumption that international agreements come from cooperation among governments, that they represent cooperation, that an agreement is, in a sense, a unit of cooperation, an instance of cooperation. The second conviction is that cooperation is good for everybody, and so the institutions that come out of cooperation ought to be respected. They have a positive political moral valence, and we should defer uh, to them. So global governance then as a kind of uh, system of international order after 1945 is often said to be progressive uh, because it rests on cooperation and mutual benefit rather than coercion and domination. Well, I don't think that we have to think very long to see that that's not a very good story of the actual second half of the 20th century. It might capture some things, but what it leaves out is equally important, at least. Historically, we can see that that period is overflowing with examples of coercion and domination by lots of actors and also by the U.S. government. Uh, the U.S. uses force and its sort of underlying influence and coercion um, to jostle others, to bully others, to push others into the institutions or agreements that the U.S. wants. And as the U.S. changes what it's looking to accomplish, it changes its focus of bullying and jostling and influencing so that it tries to keep the institutional structure aligned with the goals of the American government of the time. All of that is going on, it's no surprise. It's not particularly captured in the idea of cooperation. And I think it's also a hint that there's something more to be, to be talked about here uh, rather than cooperation. Equally, anybody who's familiar with the, the nitty gritty of international negotiations knows that a big part of getting an agreement is finding the leverage relative to the others around the table such that you might narrow their options or uh, shift the, the menu of choices that they've got so that they come to accept the thing that suits you. And this is kind of a more macro point, or I'm sorry, more micro point built into the very process of producing international agreements is a lot of stuff that's not at all cooperative. It involves shaping the terrain of decisions for other parties so that they end up agreeing to the thing that you've been putting forward, or at least agreeing to some modified version where you can find common ground. So the idea of common ground coming out of negotiations that is, uh, in a way, the heart of the cooperation metaphor is, I think, not very practically relevant when we think about how real international agreements happen. The field of negotiation is shaped by the power that the parties bring to it in kind of the same way that gravity shapes the fabric of space and time and makes some things more likely to happen than others, it affects outcomes um, by shaping the context in which action happens. These two little examples suggest that the cooperation metaphor isn't a very good way of thinking about international affairs. And I think it goes a little further too. I would push a little further and suggest that it's actually kind of pernicious because it rests on the assumption that what comes out of international agreements is by definition good for all parties or good for everybody, perhaps. This is a story that we hear in a lot of kind of not very um, deep analyses of kind of the liberal internationalist understanding of, of international politics and maybe of American foreign policy uh, in particular. That story of a kind of inherent goodness to international cooperation gives the impression that there are no losers from these arrangements, that everybody wins, or maybe better said, everybody who matters wins, and that anybody who's not part of the winning coalition probably doesn't matter. And I think that there, there's a missed opportunity. We can think more realistically and get a better understanding of contemporary history if we start to think about how these arrangements are distributing gains and losses how they're making trade-offs among competing objectives. This requires that we give up a little our, our happy assumption that uh, the, the good outcome comes out of the negotiations because everybody agrees to it, so therefore they must be happy with it. And we recognize instead that the arrangements 
reflect advantages for some and disadvantages for others. Once we do that, then the empirical research that we can do in global governance gets more interesting. We start to look around the world of international treaties and organizations and wonder how they're redistributing harm and gain, who's winning and who's losing. I think this helps us understand international politics a little better because we can start to understand resistance. We can start to see why some people are not happy with the current system. And we have to get quite fine grained here. We can look at individual treaties and specific elements in treaties and see how these are, are harming people or helping people. And that gives us a way to start thinking more concretely, pragmatically about the real politics of, of global governance and see that the people who are opposed or resisting or recalcitrant may not be uh, in favor of, uh, of, of going back to the 15th century or of, um, of chaos or just being sort of difficult and not going along with things, but it may well be that they see that their interests are being harmed by the way the institutional rules have been written and are being applied and that their political response uh, needs to be understood, whether you wanna defend the rules or change them or fight against them. Understanding that dynamic of resistance is really important. So those are some of the themes that I bring forward. Uh, Jonas, shall I pass it over to you and uh, we can take things from there? Thanks a lot, Ian, and, and very thoughtful and interesting uh, thoughts. And uh, I, I wish I could disagree on on a lot. So there will be a there would be a, a, a great debate here, but I. I I find myself agreeing to a lot of what you said, uh, but I'll, I'll try to elaborate on that. Uh, but first of all, thanks for, for this opportunity uh, to, to interact with you and, and uh, for, for being hosted at the Buffett Institute. Uh, and uh, what I would like to do is to maybe offer three points of, of agreement or, or basic points, understandings that I see it from my perspective. And then I would try to offer two points of, of disagreement. And then I thought uh, after those three and two points, I would give you one example of where cooperation works the way it should, but I'd rather have five small uh, examples and maybe one of them is uh, convincing, but uh, let's see. So three, two, one, uh, I would like to, to elaborate on. And, and as uh, was mentioned in the, in the kind introduction, my background is international human rights law and, uh, and European Union law, and that's what I focused on some i also come from a particular uh, perspective you could say in international relations international law where where the legal system and the interaction is slightly different than international law in general so the examples and the points i will make also draw on that very much but then uh, the first firstly the, th the three points of, of agreement or, or my basic understanding of the situation uh, the way cooperation works today, with the, as I see it, the interest is not always aligned, as Ian is saying, with, with that of the people or that of the good cause uh, uh, or, or so. Rather, it's a, very often a narrow government power uh, influence related focus. So in that sense, it's far from ideal. Uh, and I, I agree with that uh, starting point. And, and a second point is that something different would be would be better or might be better. We've worked with the sort of the state based system for at least 400 years uh, and, and further back as well. Uh, and we've had the states during those years, th those many centuries as the main actors and the enforcers of, of power for good and bad. Uh, so that's my second point of, of agreement. And, and thirdly, uh, an alternative to international cooperation would need to come with, with the incentives, something Ian also mentioned, to comply. So there would have to be a, a system that would uh, have some form of, of influence that is as strong or stronger than, than uh, governments for, for that to work. And, and maybe I will uh, have something in, in the direction of answering that or at least allude to an answer or start to decipher an answer uh, uh, when I'm done with my points here. So those were my three sort of points of, of, of agreement. And then if I try to disagree in, in two points. So yes, uh, again, I'm, I'm finding myself agreeing. Uh, cooperation is not all good, uh, but other goals 
can and often are aligned with the with the good goals, with the with the good things in life. Uh, and a small example of that, I think, is is how international human rights law is often uh, proposed and and uh, advocated for by by opposition parties. And when they come into power, they are less inclined to 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 remember that human rights should be something that we should act on. So it's very often in, in uh, across the globe, I would say that you can find the opposition parties arguing for human rights eloquently and well and strongly. And when they come into power, maybe less so. And and part of this uh, disagreement is also the the pressure. We need some kind of uh, financial pressure or peer pressure or a club, and with that we can get alignment uh, with the, with a good cause. And there, I think, in particular, of the European Union as an example, uh, where I work, which is easy for me to, to think about. Uh, it's not at all the case that, that governments want to agree with the European Union, be it on the rule of law or on uh, uh, trade agreements or uh, whatever it might be. But very often you need that, uh, of course, financial peer pressure, uh, the club, uh, the resources uh, of some sort to, to agree, and that causes sometimes an alignment between the government interests and the, the, the good goals, if we continue to use that uh, uh, phrase. So my second point of disagreement, uh, uh, attempt of disagreeing, I should say, uh, is that public international law is an imperfect tool for international human rights law. What does that mean? If you th think of reservations to treaties. It comes from multilateral or bilateral treaties in, in other areas. Uh, you can remove a clause that you think is not applicable to you uh, in a multilateral treaty, for instance, and say that I'm, my country is not bound by this. But that, that logic is not ideal for human rights, right? And that is used by some countries to remove difficult uh, uh, provisions uh, which, in which, with which they are not in compliance uh, from the monitoring mechanism. That could, of course, be possible, positive also for international rights law because the, that way governments might actually accede to or become party to a treaty. But uh, it also causes some some uh, concerns, of course, when when they exclude very important or crucial parts of a human rights treaty. Uh, another example is maybe the Migrant Workers Convention, where uh, none of the European Union countries have, have uh, become parties, not even signed. So you have a block of 27 collectively uh, obstructing, as I see it, international human rights law development by, by none of them agreeing to this treaty so far. At the same time, it's important, as I uh, referenced already, that international human rights law is, is slightly different. It's, uh, it's coming from a different perspective. If we think of the founders of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which in a way is the the document preceding all the human rights treaties. Uh, they were not state representatives, all of them. They were, they were uh, experienced diplomats, but they were very often uh, quite philosophically inclined. And they were elaborating on this uh, document coming out of the World War, which had a strong incentive of breaking with the, with the past. They realized that they had to come up with something new. Uh, apart from those founders and the, the way it was created and, and drafted in a very new international setting, we also have the development of monitoring mechanisms, which exist in, exists in other parts, but for international rights law, very often uh, uh, very strong mechanisms uh, with independent persons, and in that sense offering an independent scrutiny. And in that way, uh, it could be very often a, a weapon of the week to, to quote Ian's writings. So there I try to disagree a little bit, saying that uh, goals can be aligned in, through cooperation, and I, very often there's no alternative to cooperation. And public international law uh, is an imperfect tool, uh, but with international rights law, we can see some uh, some progress, I think, uh, where, where cooperation uh, is, is made for, for a better cause than government interests at times. Then coming to uh, the example, which ended up being five examples where cooperation works. 
and maybe maybe there are four or five uh, competition between courts and monitoring mechanisms in the international human rights law arena is something very positive as i see it 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 can be a race to the top there are courts uh, for the council of europe with its 47 members there is a court for the european union with its 27 members and there are un treaty bodies there are other monitoring mechanisms and i think that a competition can be very healthy and the alignment of the jurisprudence is to some extent uh, taking place and it's and to some extent it's a competition and when i look at such mechanisms i think uh, cooperation is is clearly leading to the good things and there's a dynamic development of the jurisprudence that that takes uh, the development uh, or that takes the instrument, the original instrument, to a higher level and ensures the, that common good. My second example relates to what Professor Riles was saying in the beginning, referring to uh, Sustainable Development Goal 16. And a small example there, uh, one of the indicators under Goal 16 relates to Paris Principles compliant national human rights institutions. So. Uh, that means that the institutions, the national human rights institutions, has to have to be in compliance with the 1991-93 Paris Principles, which talks about independence and effectiveness, which also stems from the Vienna Declaration from, from uh, some 30 years ago as well. Uh, and here, I think the cooperation, even if the state, if, even if there was a state interest that originally proposed this or advocated this uh, to some extent i suppose it was but over the years uh, more than half of the world's countries have uh, paris principles compliant nhri and of the 27 in the european union we have a good half that have such institutions and also here i can see this dynamic development similar to the uh, the, the developments we see in courts and monitoring mechanisms third example international humanitarian law leaving international rights law slightly thinking of anti-personal mines, binding weapons, dum dum bullets, etc., that have been banned for, for uh, sometimes well over 100 years. Uh, there could very well have been uh, less uh, noble reasons why these were banned, and there, there still are uh, less noble reasons, but uh, they are very beneficial and lead to, to good things. So again, an alignment of of the intended, uh, of the good interests, uh, the good purpose, and uh, and the possible slightly diverging uh, state interest. Fourth example: the European Union itself, uh, starting off uh, at the same time as the United Nations, more or less, uh, and and has developed into not only as not only an international organization, but a supranational, where it doesn't require unanimity on all questions. And even though that organization didn't have a strong human rights mandate to, in the beginning, it has uh, uh, been forced to adopt the human rights mandate through its jurisprudence from the 1970s, where basically the, the national courts were saying, we will not give you more, more uh, mandate in the, for the European Union unless you ensure that fundamental rights uh, are respected, human rights. And again, that might not have been for the for the all for the good re all for only for the good reasons, but eventually benefiting uh, people. And the last example is something that I spend a lot of my time on uh, these days. It's called a sustainable finance uh, platform. There exists one. There, there is one existing at the international level with 15 countries so far. Japan just joined the other day, and it's an initiative by the European Union. Which has its, uh, uh, which has as a purpose to encourage uh, sustainable investments globally, uh, and at an EU level, uh, there is a more operational uh, similarity, a sustainable finance platform, a European sustainable finance platform, and I'm uh, on that platform, and it has uh, the same purpose to ensure encourage financial uh, investments that are sustainable. And in the European Union, sustainability in line with the SDGs has been defined to include social aspects and human rights. So there's a strong human rights requirement built into EU law that was adopted in June this year that relates to this platform. And, and here again, I can see that uh, a lot of pressure, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, etc., forces the union to take action 
because of the COVID-19 situation in, in the EU, uh, a thought on developing a, uh, or including a social taxonomy as part of the, the green taxonomy for this uh, platform or for the sustainable uh, finance uh, meant that they speeded up uh, the social bit and included uh, this much earlier than they otherwise, otherwise would have. So uh, COVID has had this positive effect of, of pushing for a, a quicker application of, of a social uh, or including social elements into the sustainability of, of investments. So that was my fifth example. If you lost count, I think I, I might have lost count myself. So what I've been saying, uh, I agree to a great extent with Ian. I, I try to disagree and then I see this alignment uh, sometimes uh, being very productive and it can, it can be a very, uh, a very uh, good way of reaching uh, results with the, with the, the way that the, can, the world is, is run by, by governments and states. So I think the future is rather to work on how to increase pressure and seek alignment of goals. So, uh, and, and I think the examples that I gave, including sustainable finance, uh, supports that line of thought. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you both so much. So much to talk about here. I just want to remind everyone that if you have questions or comments or critiques or ideas, please just put them in the chat and we'll post those. Um, to start, Ian, I just want to see whether you have any uh, responses or thoughts to Jonas. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to, I think, spoil the whole format by agreeing with his points of disagreement. Because what I like in how you were talking, Jonas, is the sense that you've brought in the substantive politics of these agreements and rules and situations as you want to analyze whether they are worth our support or not. So you've talked a lot there about, about whether the rules align with good goals or not. And I think that's the right kind of question. We want to think practically about how the rules are affecting varied political interests. So then we can judge whether the interests that they are serving are ones that we support or not. And you, and I like your language of describing law and these institutions as tools that can be used presumably for various purposes. So they could be used well, or they could be used poorly. And what you've done is bring in the substantive political trade-offs that I'm talking about into the analysis of global governance. And I think that's a really useful step. It makes the analysis of global governance look a little more like domestic governance. In domestic politics, we think all the time about trade-offs from rules. We don't assume, for instance, that the tax code is good for everybody. We are aware that the tax code creates winners and losers. It assigns different kinds of categories to different kinds of income and wealth and different actors and religious exemptions and all of that. When we think about the tax code domestically, we recognize how politically salient it is because it influences people's interests differently. And that's why it gets so much attention from lobbyists and all the rest. So we're used to thinking this way about domestic governance. We don't think of a tax code or a parking permit as a cooperative relationship between me and the government agency. There may be some volunteerism to it, but we don't describe it as cooperation. And I think there's good reasons why, because there's a sense of coercion lurking in the background. And I think global governance can be analyzed in much the same way. This, and the SDGs are a nice example in what you've been suggesting, I think, is that, um, that we need to pay attention to the implementation of these, of these goals in order to see how then they are affecting different people's interests differently. So then we can understand where resistance comes from or what the benefits might be. In the application, we have to think about all those details. And that's, in a sense, where the politics comes in. The grand aspirations that are described at the top level of the SDGs, I think, could be agreed by pretty much everybody. And that is kind of universal. But I think we all know that the real action is in how these things impinge on actual interests. and. And that's where I'm encouraging uh, scholarship on law and politics to put their attention. That's great. Thank you. Um, so lots of questions. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just uh, start off. I, I, most of what you were both talking about, not exclusively, but mostly was cooperation among state actors, especially in forms of treaties and international institutions. And I'm wondering to what extent you would both push your analyses 
to apply to non-state institutions. My own real interest right now is in this new nuclear ban treaty, which is pretty much a civil society cooperation mechanism using digital technologies rather and, and very much against most nation states, although finding points of cooperation with some nation states. So I'm wondering what, what you think about that. Ian, would you also say that a lot of the cooperation we see in civil society today has the same problems of inequality and violence and hidden power dynamics, um, or would you have a different different view? I have a different view, I think, because what I'm thinking about in the form of the government, the state, the public authority, um, kind of precludes any possibility of cooperation because it's really founded on this sort of deep-seated inequality that is governance. The governance isn't about cooperation, it's about an imposition or a requirement or the capacity of the public authority to shape your field of possibility. When non-state actors come together, the dynamics I think are, are necessarily different because no one presumably has that kind of authority over the others. So the social context is quite different. But your your right to focus on activists and, and private groups, because as Jonas was saying, if international law and institutions are tools, then they're tools that can be taken up by the character you're talking about. They're not monopolized by governments. And some of the most interesting activist progressive uses of international law came from outside the state, as you're both suggesting, and kind of got pushed into the state realm not necessarily welcomed by the governments, but forced there by activists who found ways to use these tools for the goals they're interested in. Yeah, maybe Jonas following up, uh, to what extent are you seeing that the digitization of international human rights law through all the new digital technologies we're using right now for this conversation and so on is changing the character of international human rights law and practice? Thanks. Okay. First, I wanted to mention that the, the last example I gave there with the sustainability, sustainable finance uh, also has a very strong component of, of non-state actors involved. So it's an, uh, a legislative uh, an advisory body in a way uh, based on, on EU legislation that includes uh, business representatives and civil society in addition to EU institutions. Uh, so I think that uh, I wanted to highlight in, in, in given the previous question there. On the digital side, of course it does. Uh, of course we, we know with the, with the Arab Spring and other uh, contexts that uh, technology has been uh, tremendous uh, in, in stimulating change. But we also see with the, with the limitations that, uh, that uh, the need to use, to rely on technology, that fundamental rights, human rights can be restrained. The agency where I work has published uh, reports the, the last few months on how COVID-19 measures uh, prevents uh, civil society from acting, from, prevents access to, to courts, etc. So in that sense, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's crucial in, in both ways. It can, it can enable and it can limit very much. And uh, I thought you were you had read up on my work and was going to ask me about the specific tool and, and what we've done, uh, yeah. uh, work that I've led to, yeah. that I, work that I've led uh, relates to a, a tool that brings together United Nations and Council of Europe and, and eventually also European Union human rights mechanisms to, to, uh, with, through modern technology that enables you to look at all these systems in, in one place. And, and that is a small contribution at least to, to using these modern technologies for, for a common good. Interesting. Okay, great. Maybe another question to either or both of you um, from um, Ambassador Ian Kelly, who um, points out that a lot of cooperation in uh, international organizations like NATO and the EU is based on at least uh, an ideology of shared values, shared cultural values, democratic values, and so on. And um, what is the impact then when you have members coming in, Turkey for NATO, Hungary and Poland for the EU, which do not share all of those democratic values? And I mean, Jonas, I know this is an issue of deep concern to you, especially in terms of the Asian values debate. Um, so to either of you. Jonas, do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. Um... 
So in the, in the Treaty on European Union, the, the second article, uh, so the, the first one establishes the union, the second one prescribes the values, the rule of law, uh, democracy, human rights, and then goes on to detail a uh, number of specifics of that. And uh, the European Union, as you know, is struggling uh, and has been struggling for the almost the last 10 years with some of its member states that have at least appears not to be uh, too keen on these values, or they are uh, maybe arguing that they are, they are in compliance with the values, but they are being uh, uh, interpreted in a political way. Uh, and that's, of course, highly problematic, not only for the values themselves, but also for the functioning of, the, of an organization like the European Union, where independence of courts uh, is relevant for the internal market, etc. Uh, and the European Union is, is relying on or you, trying to use all its tools, political, judicial, legal, to try to uh, come to an understanding or try to uh, get... And here I, I could also you have used as an example the alignment and the leverage with the, with the, that the European Union uses, uh, trying to get uh, an agreement right now on how to use the EU funds, which are significant amounts of money, to, to push the member states that are less uh, convinced by, by the rule of law arguments that they have to change in order to access uh, these funds. And that's a very has become a very political issue uh, in the European Union. How to, how to get out of it, I'm not sure yet, but hopefully within days, at least some of these problems will be solved through political uh, or otherwise, otherwise other means. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I would add too that it kind of is a, a typical uh, problem of international institutions, perhaps of all institutions, that they need to find some way to accommodate the diversity of political goals of the members. Mm -hmm. um, in the cases that you mentioned, the diversity of goals, as, as, as Ambassador Kelly said, presumably increased with the addition of these new members. And then it's a kind of standard institutional problem to try to figure out what to do with that new collection of pressures, whether the organization wants to bend uh, and, and become more more tolerant and diverse in a sense, or whether it wants to stick to what it originally thought, what its original members, early members thought were its core political values. And that's an, an institutional problem that I think we see in the sociology of institutions in business and in uh, international affairs. Okay, we have another question related to the pandemic. So maybe we could put this under the topic of cooperation in conditions of crisis. So, maybe we could have both an empirical version of the question and a normative version. The empirical version would be, what do you both see in a moment like COVID in terms of institutions capacity or willingness to cooperate? Are they, do you see more cooperation or less cooperation or different kinds of cooperation in times of crisis like the one we're in now? And then from a more normative point of view, um, should we expect a, a different kind of cooperation? Is this a moment for for change in terms of the way that we uh, deal with one another across national boundaries? So maybe Ian, we'll start with you this time. Sure. What I see is uh, that the crisis is revealing a lot about the institutions that we were already living with. And we might not have been able to quite see some of their features. I mean this in the US, obviously, with the kind of absence of a federal government that that vacuum in the US has meant that uh, the crisis has become a much more local government response, state and local issues, uh, affairs, so that there, um, the diversity there is really quite striking. And at the same time, internationally, it's helping to reveal the power of some of these private actors, pharma companies, but most interesting to me, the philanthropic foundations, like the Gates Foundation, which are acting in ways that I, I would have expected public authorities to behave if I'd imagined this crisis a year ago and filling the gap in a sense. So they're kind of uh, manipulating the cooperative landscape to produce mm -hmm. vaccine research, vaccine production, and all the rest with funding and with direct science. Um, so I think those entities were lurking out there and the boundary between international public and international private authorities was blurry, but this has really made it stark where we see Gates in particular stepping into the void 
that was left by governments. Um, although the WHO, I think, has done a fine job. We don't, I wouldn't expect it to do a whole lot more than it has done. But the absence of governments is striking. That's fascinating. Yanis, what do you see? A couple of small points, maybe. I think for the European Union, it has been a very good lesson. Uh, it has not, uh, the, the COVID-19 has not necessarily led to uh, greater uh, cooperation right away. On the contrary, there seemed to be uh, divergence immediately on how to deal with it uh, between countries, closing borders, uh, trying to uh, trying not to cooperate on ordering uh, medical equipment, etc. But uh, eventually, it took some months, but eventually the EU has been able to step up its, its uh, work in this area. And uh, by now, I think all the member states have understood that you cannot have an internal market uh, and exclude an important area like fighting a pandemic. And uh, a small example I just read the other, the other day was that they, they closed down the shops in, in Belgium and a couple of kilometers away on the other side of the border, they were not closed. And of course, all the Belgians would go there and do their shopping. So you, for the European Union, it, it's a, a reminder that issues are not stopping at the border, be it environment or pandemics or or uh, crime or what have you. And, and uh, the second example that comes to mind is the, the shift that I already mentioned when, when it comes to sustainable investments, uh, encouraging more sustainable investments in, in the EU. And that the original idea in the legislation was to include the environmental aspects only, uh, and only in five years or so introduce the social aspects. Mm -hmm. But uh, the COVID highlighted the importance of cooperation in the social area. And for that reason, uh, they sort of fast track the social dimension and it's currently then being explored on how how to force, in a way, investments to be able to label themselves sustainable, uh, that that would also include human rights uh, compliance. Very interesting. So um, I, I just on this point about the sustainable finance platform, Jonas, we have a question about how we perceive successful outcomes. So one of the challenges um, I think for many people in believing in international cooperation is that uh, it's hard to see the results, see positive results. You know, the environment just keeps getting worse. There's still poverty. There's still, um, you know, lots of refugee problems. The more work we do, the, it, we don't see the outcome. And so the question is, have you been able to build any concrete outcomes into this new tool, the platform, so that people can see the results of their progress and therefore feel greater commitment to engaging in international cooperation? Difficult to say, I suppose. Uh, the legislation was adopted uh, in this with this specific example in June this year, and the platform started working a, a good month ago. Uh, and the legislation uh, will kick in 2021 and 2022. Uh, but uh, I think it, it, I think at least investors will have to, will, will immediately realize that they will have to comply with this in order to be uh, uh, complying. The European Union talks about taxonomy alignment. So investments have to be taxonomy alignment, meaning that they have to deliver on certain environmental goals and eventually also social goals and they can do no significant harm to the other ones. And this relates very much to issues like greenhouse uh, gas, gas emissions. And I think that is something that speaks both as a topic to people, uh, that the EU, uh, as an example, is doing something on the environment, uh, and also uh, uh, being concrete and, and, uh, and uh, dealing with issues, not only by, by uh, committing the governments, but also trying to rein in or influence the, the market uh, forces. So I, I think it's a very, so far, very obscure uh, example, but eventually I think it will kick in with the green labelings and social labelings and stuff like that. And it's not, it's not a slow process, so I think it will happen green bonds, social bonds, uh, even uh, COVID-19 uh, so bond, related bonds I've, I've heard of. So I think we will see a lot more of that. And Ian, I would expect maybe you're quite skeptical of this kind of project where there's a sort of governmentality to the way everything is labeled and 
um, we're all, you know, we may not even realize what regime we're having to agree to because of all these this this taxonomy alignment going on. I, what is your reaction to this project? Anything? I think it sounds excellent in the sense that I'm approaching these things as a social scientist. So trying to understand what people mean when they talk about international cooperation and then trying to get a handle on what consequences there are from that behavior in a social science sense. And what Jonas has described sounds like a terrific social science experiment where he can talk elegantly and in detail about the specific rules and how they anticipate that will change the incentives and behaviors. And then we can watch down the road and see how this turns into reality and then think about how it affects the values that we care about. So social science wise, I think that's a terrific experiment. And his, his conceptual way of speaking, Jonas does, if I can talk about you as if you're not here, is also terrific in that it is open to the possibility that all of this might go awry or, or if different leaders came in and used these tools for other basic purposes, we might get some outcomes that are unintended and in fact might be terrible, but that given the understanding that he's presented, here's how it's designed to work and we'll see how it works. So my social science research project here is simply to remind everybody to look for the trade-offs in global governance and to remember that these rules are not for the benefit of everybody. There must be costs and harms distributed there somehow and we would be intellectually dishonest as researchers if we weren't looking for those costs. It's not a normative position for or against global institutions by any means. Great. Um, so, Ian, we have a, a question about the WHO in the COVID crisis as an example of cooperation or maybe failed cooperation or flawed cooperation and the relationship between cooperation and scientific findings and scientific evidence. You know, the WHO, as we all know, was slow to come to certain kinds of scientific um, uh, consensus, partly because they had to get cooperation from a lot of nations to reach consensus, um, and that was critiqued. What's your view on the place of science in cooperation? Is science a force that can help us to reach better cooperation? Is it a yardstick for understanding when cooperation is good or bad? Is it just a different epistemic regime altogether? What do you think? I think the episode is a great example of why we shouldn't be talking about cooperation when we talk about international organizations. What the World Health Organization did is entirely predictable based on its structure and its form. As a more or less classic public international organization, it has governments as its members and it gets its funding mostly from governance, although now with the Gates Foundation, it's a little different. So it's a government run organization. It does what the governments want. It is responsive to its most powerful members and it receives information on health crises from government authorities in its member countries and its member territories. So what it is able to communicate to the world when a new epidemic comes along is dependent on what the governments are telling it. It has a small amount of kind of early warning capacity to detect things that are happening but through the media to supplement what the government tells it, but it's got no capacity to second guess or redo the testing that governments do. So what the WHO did was more or less follow the, the only script it's got, uh, which is to uh, send up flares, as it were, when public health authorities in member countries detect new problems, and that it did. Now, it also has these scientific advisory bodies, as you're hinting about, and it was slow to get that group to acknowledge the aerosolization that's so important here. Um, that, I think, might be better, best explained by the logic of large groups that have to agree on something through a committee form and that that takes time and the foot dragging more conservative people need more more uh, more convincing that takes time but not really a, a problem of the organization itself so really the who i think has behaved as well as we could expect under its circumstances where it's beholden to its member governments i mean Jonas, is it a problem of just um us, you know, the ordinary public um, person not really understanding how to read the language of the WHO. I mean, when you say that something is regrettable, Eunice, 
for the European Union. That means it's really, really bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and when the okay. WHO says that there might be an issue, it means there's really an issue, right? And it's just that we didn't understand how to read it. Uh, is, is we just need more sophistication as consumers or is this evidence of a real flaw in, in cooperation? The WHO case, what would you say? Difficult for me to, to comment on that. Uh, I know too little, but uh, from what I've seen um, uh, from other contexts, international organizations, of course, there's a risk that we speak uh, a particular language uh, that is, is not understood. But of course, the governments uh, speak the same language very often, uh, if not always. And, and uh, uh, Ian referred to the, the member states being in the driving seat and, and shaping the way these organizations work. And, and uh, of course, the, the organizations are, in this case, never really better than the member states. They, they get the funding, they get the green light, they get the, the incentives to, to take action by the member states. So in that sense, the European Union has, with its supranational uh, character, a bit of a, a greater responsibility to, to deliver than an international organization. Uh, and and uh, yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that, and, rather than trying to uh complicate things <laughs> um, myself um so um maybe uh, jonas i wanted to ask you about about cooperation with um uh entities or nations that Share, that have very, very different values, you know, not just the situation of saying one is in compliance, but, you know, um, perhaps not being fully in compliance by someone else's point of view, but rather asserting an entirely different value structure. And I'm thinking in particular about the work that you do, um, trying to find common ground um, in, with, with, with China in particular on human rights issues. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you find hope in that work, or where where it is that you um, manage to find um, to see progress in situations where um, there just is not um, agreement um, on the fundamentals. Thanks. Yeah, I guess uh, personally, it has to, it's important to be optimistic and maybe naive to boot, uh, but. Of course, I also sometimes do not see a positive development, but I guess the benchmark matters a lot. If you have as a benchmark the current situation or a past situation, but if you imagine that the situation could be even worse if you didn't do anything, of course, you have a, a positive uh, development, even if things are going in the wrong direction. So sometimes I suppose it's simply to prevent uh, deterioration or, or things to go in the wrong direction. But I think also if we look back, uh, you know, take a longer perspective, we very often see that things have happened. It might feel, uh, and working for an organization like the European Union, it, it might not always feel like we're doing a lot uh, or, or taking great steps, but these smaller steps over time adds up. Uh, and there are, in different languages, ways of capturing that with, with the proverbs. But, uh, but uh, I think that's part of it, that you, you have to use a benchmark that is to your, to your favor, I suppose. <laughs> in life in general, I like that. Um, so, and maybe Ian, um, just to, to have with a follow-up, um, there was a story in the New York Times, I think on Sunday, uh, about human rights activists in the United States who were concerned that um, the Trump administration, ironically, might have been better for human rights in places like China then the Biden administration will be precisely because the Biden administration is so bent on cooperation uh, and not confrontation. Um, so what do you think about that? Is it is it true that the, I mean, that in the end, the sort of more confrontational America first approach might produce better human rights results in the long run in those situations where values are very, very different? Well, I'm really interested in getting empirical here. I don't see a whole lot of evidence that what Trump was doing was helping <laughs> human rights anywhere, here, there, or on the moon. So I found that story a little bit puzzling on, on that front, on the substantive side. Now, but the other thing is, I'm not, uh, I don't think that we can really uh, make a dichotomy between cooperation and confrontation. So I, th I would prefer to think about these governments approaching each other 
in the pursuit of certain goals, they're trying to get something done. Activists as well. They're trying to do something. And mm. sometimes those some things overlap enough that they can form an agreement around it. Sometimes they don't. Mm. Uh, the, each side is trying to use its leverage to try to bring the other closer to its position. And that's just the normal course of politics and of negotiation. So the agreements that come out of it are going to reflect the goals that the governments are putting into it. So if, if Trump and Putin and Assad in Syria come to some agreement about how Assad should stay in power in Syria for 10 more years, you could say in a technical sense, that's an element of international cooperation. It's a multilateral agreement on how things ought to go that reflects the shared interests of those leaders. So in some sense, a formal way, that's cooperation. But the thing that presumably we care about are what are the political values that are invested in the form of cooperation and how does that intergovernmental agreement then affect people who have different interests, the people who disagree with it, who's benefiting and who's paying the costs. So the generic form of cooperation is not particularly interesting. That's why I think that it's not that helpful to talk about it because it's kind of misleading. It tricks us into thinking that this is all good stuff and it's like enchanted, wonderful magicness where an international agreement solves the problem. But as Jonas has suggested, nobody actually thinks that who knows anything about the specifics of these agreements. They're all experiments, attempts, essays into trying to shape things in a direction that you think is good. And if we treat them in that way, then I think we get a more realistic account of what they're doing. And maybe we also become better users of the tool of international agreement. Interesting, interesting. So, um, so Ian, we have a question from um, uh, Bob Rowley for you. Isn't the current administration's rejection of so many agreements and treaties a loss for the democratic forces in the world? And doesn't it underscore the advantages of cooperation by seeing what happens in its absence? Yeah, that's interesting. Hi, Bob. Um, well, let's take the the NAFTA agreement um, and its and its repeat in the in the social science way. I've had a hard time trying to figure out if the new U.S. Canada Mexico agreement is an example of international cooperation or not. In a kind of formal way, it is, because here's this new agreement that the countries have agreed to, but everybody understands the history and knows that there was NAFTA before, and then Trump came along and basically wanted something that he could rename. Did Canada and Mexico cooperate with the U.S. in the new agreement? I think it's kind of hard to describe that as cooperation. They certainly saw some advantage to playing along, and they extracted a few goodies for themselves along the way, and they let Trump rename it. So is a kind of coding thing, like how do we know if we're looking at cooperation? I don't really know if these agreements count as cooperation or not, but I think that, that Bob is right to focus the, our attention not so much on the form of international agreement, but on the content of what political values it, it advances. And that could be pro-democracy, it could be pro-working people, it could be anti-environment, it could be lots of things. The form is kind of generic. The question is, how is it actually affecting interests, different interests, making trade-offs, and what do we feel about those interests? Is it a bit like with the tax law? Do we like the rules because they're favoring us? Do we like the rules because we think it's helping people who deserve to be helped? Do we hate the rules? The same questions, I think, should apply to all of these agreements. Great. So we have time for one more question to both of you. So Jonas, for you, um, obviously this is a, 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 moment, a, a moment in American foreign policy. We have a new Secretary of State who will soon be coming in, Antony Blinken. What advice would you have for him about how to engage more cooperatively with the European Union going forward? Wow, that's a big one. Uh, from the little I've, I've seen so far, the little I've read, rather, uh, it, it looks like they're doing the, 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 good, the good things. Uh, and uh, I would think that talking about cooperation, talking about international exchanges, uh, mutual cooperation is, is good in itself. And coming back to your previous question, I think uh, leading by example uh, is the long term and, and mid term and maybe even the short term way to lead. If, we, if we, we might be able to achieve things with the power and force for the short term, but mid term, long term, leading by example pays off. And I, I, it seems like this is the path that will be 
used to some extent uh, much better by the new, new administration. Interesting. Ian, um, I hope that um, Andy Blinken is reading your work carefully. Um, what uh, what advice would uh, would come from your work, you think, for him right now? What would you suggest? I guess what I would like to see is some clarity of goals. So to the extent that you can express what it is you're looking to accomplish, I think that's really helpful. Um, and it's weird to be saying that, and it's only worth saying because we've been absent that for the last few years. It was never really clear what the Trump White House was trying to do in foreign affairs other than insult people. So I guess what I'm interested in are the goals that the new administration is gonna invest in uh, at home and abroad, because it is it, that's the substance of the thing. Um, and then not insulting people seems like a real benefit too. Well said, excellent. Well, this is great. Thank you both so much for sharing your thoughts and your knowledge with us today. This is a great discussion. Thank you all for attending, for participating. Um, uh, we encourage you to subscribe to our mailing list uh, to receive notices about next events. I'll just uh, preview the very next um, event in this series will be Tuesday, December 15th at 12 p.m. Central Time. And it will feature Northwestern Associate Professor of African American Studies, Dr. Barnard Hesse, in conversation with McGill University Associate Professor of Political Science, Dr. Deborah Thompson, about the schematic state. So thank you both very, very much for this great discussion. I learned a great deal, and I'm sure everyone else did too. And um, please stay healthy. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot.